Ah, all right. So uh, I'll start by giving a bit of a brief introduction to NVMe in general, and then how NVMe over fabrics kind of builds on top of that, and what are some of the differences in a fabrics implementation compared to the PCI Express version. Uh, then I'll dig into uh, the implementation that I've done so far for FreeBSD. Um, we'll get more when we get there. And lastly, I'll talk about future work in particular. The implementation I have is definitely not complete, but uh, there's more to do. And then if we magically have time, which I doubt, I have uh, some pre-canned slides showing a demo. We could even do live if there's a miracle in the space-time continuum. Um, so some, let's go over some basics about what NVMe, which is NVM Express, which is a, uh, a standard for uh, managing originally storage that was non-volatile memory, so it's primarily targeted at flash, although I think when reading the NVMe 2.0 spec, there are extensions to handle spinning rust, which seems kind of odd. Uh, NVMe defines a protocol that you use to issue commands to the controller, and it's kind of similar in nature to SCSI and ATA, except perhaps simpler, certainly simpler than SCSI. Uh, and the, s the terminology NVMe uses is also in some cases gratuitously different from other storage things. So I'll try to explain their nomenclature. Uh, in NVMe terms, a host is kind of the client side uh, or in SCSI terms, I may consider it an initiator. Um, but the host is the thing that's going to be kind of reading data or writing. So you can think of a device driver uh, for a PCI device being the host, whereas the controller is the actual thing managing the storage that's servicing requests. Uh, so the PCI device would be the controller in the PCI model. Uh, and the, the, the kind of general flow of how things work in NVMe is you have FIFO queues uh, that are kind of unidirectional but going in each direction. So you have submission queues uh, that a host uses to send commands to a controller. And then you have completion queues where a controller responds, uh, the stat reports the status of a command back to the host. Um, yeah, on a completion queue, sorry. These queue entries are fixed in size. So submission queue entries are 64 bytes and completion queue entries are 16 bytes. And I'll probably uh, on occasions refer to them by their acronyms of SQEs and CQEs. Uh, there are two different types of queues in NVMe. You have an administrative queue that you use to kind of handle generally non-IO related requests. But this is how you can fetch things like uh, meta, uh, additional information about the drive. For example, if you want to fetch um, error logs, you do it by commands on the administrative queue. And then you have IO queues that actually handle real IO commands like read and write. And then do I say it on here? Uh, okay, I see it somewhere else. So what does the kind of general control flow look like? Uh, you have a, I have a host on the left and a controller on the right. Um, and to start with, the host will allocate, and this, this is for PCI, the host will allocate uh, a kind of set of queues for the, admit, for the administrative queues, or the administrative queue in memory, both a submission queue and a completion queue. And then the, ho the host will construct commands and stick them into the administrative queue, and the controller pulls them out in FIFO order. Um, and when the controller has finished a command, it puts completions into the administrative queue, and then the host can read them out. Um, one thing that I think I have on a later slide, uh, there is, no, even though the queues themselves are processed in FIFO order, completions can be out of order with respect to commands. So one of the fields in a command, or a, uh, an SQE, is a command identifier that's allocated by the host and managed by the host. And when a controller reports a completion back to the host, it includes that command identifier in the completion it's reporting to kind of match up and tell you which command it is reporting status for. <coughs> and it's the host's job to not send a command ID you already have something outstanding for it, unless you just really like excitement and corrupt data. <laughs> uh, and then you, in addition to an admin queue, you'll have one or more IO queues uh, that also have submission queues and completion queues that, you s that the host will send commands on, and you'll get completions back uh, from the controller. Uh, one different recall uh, for PCI uh, NVMe that I don't have here is that you can actually have a many-to-one mapping of submission queues to completion queues. So uh, if you wanted to, you could allocate multiple submission queues, but then tie them to a single commission completion queue or some smaller number of completion queues. 
or you can pair them one to one. It's up to however the host uh, controller decides, or the host side decides to configure the, configure the queues when it creates them. Uh, so some of the types of commands you can send on the administrating, administrative queue, including actually creating IO queues and telling the controller how many you want and where they are once you create them, as well as, for example, I mentioned fetching error log entries, and then the IO queues handle things like read and write. So what do NVMe commands look like? Uh, they're a fixed size, because I mentioned before that SQEs are 64 bytes. And this means they don't contain any data themselves. All the data that is handled, for the most part, for things like read and write, for example, all that data is done indirectly with some kind of scatter gather entry. And NVMe over PCI uses a more unique type of scatter gather entry, something it calls a PRP, where each entry is just a physical address of a page with an offset. And the length is implicit. The length is either the remaining amount of that page, based on its size and, and what the offset is, or given the kind of, uh, given the length, the total length of the command, the controller can infer how many of PRPs it's going to need to finish a request. Um, <coughs> and the command structure itself embeds two PRP entries and there are ways to kind of have that change. You can get an arbitrary number that I won't delve into here, but in particular, the head of kind of the list of your scatter gather list is embedded as part of the, a fixed size field in the fixed size command. NVMe also defines an alternate type of scatter gather list that it calls an SGL, which is a more traditional scatter gather list in that it has, uh, each element has both an address and a length, so length is not implicit or inferred. Um, and these scatter gather lists also have a type. Uh, I believe from reading the spec that it's possible to use these on PCI Express devices, although I think it's rare, like our PCI driver in FreeBSD doesn't bother using it, um, but as we'll see, NVMe Express over Fabrics uses this exclusively. Uh, and this, the, your first SG list, because you can chain those as well, is stored in the command in the same place that you would otherwise be storing your PRPs. So what do completions look like? Completions, in a, just like commands, are a fixed size. They're a, six, uh, a fixed size structure at 16 bytes in size. Um, they also do not contain any data. If you are doing a request that is going to get data back from the controller, like you're doing a read, you are, the, w the way the protocol works is you provide a scatter gather list describing that buffer in the original command, and then the controller will send that data over to that location. And then when it's done, it sends you a completion entry telling you, hey, I finished, and that's what's done. So the data is sent before the completion. And then here's where I mentioned the fact that we have command IDs to match up commands with completions because completions can arrive out of order. So that's kind of my quick and dirty NVMe over PCI. Um, and the NVMe in your laptops or the existing NVMe driver in FreeBSD and kind of what it manages. So now let's talk about how does NVMe go for a fabric, and how is that different from the PCI model? So the first thing that NVMe over fabrics does is it replaces the notion of an in-memory, mostly, an in-memory submission queue and completion queue with some kind of um, queues that are managed by your transport in a transport-specific manner. Because one of the things we'll get into is that um, NVMe over fabrics takes a... Uh, it, defined, it has a kind of different levels of abstraction, and it, it, some things are kind of deferred to the transport, how the transport specifically manages things. But a kind of at the level of generic fabrics, you have some kind of queues that can be managed in a FIFO order to submit commands to and get completions back on. But they're not necessarily in memory the same way they are for PCI. Um, it's currently defined for several transports. Uh, Fiber Channel, I think, was the first one. Um, several flavors of RDMA, although they're all kind of defined in some ways as a single transport in the spec. And then there's a definition for TCP, which is what we're going to focus on later. In fabrics, unlike in PCI, every submission queue is paired with exactly one completion queue. Um, and if, so uh, you always use the same, a single completion queue to get back your commands from the submission queue. And so many places in this talk, I'll talk about an SQ or CQ pair, or in many cases, just a Q pair. And that means a pair of both a submission queue and a completion queue that are servicing as either an admin queue pair or an IOQ pair. Um, a, in, in, in Fabric's terms, a, to avoid some 
confusion, they define some of their own words. Um, if you have kind of a logical connection between a host and the controller that contains at least one admin Q pair, or at least one IOQ pair as well as an admin Q pair, that is called an association, kind of the group of the whole thing together. And there are ways, for example, if you lose a Q pair, maybe you lose the whole association because they all go away. Um, and the reason it's called an association is that depending on your transport, you actually may have multiple underlying transport connections that are part and kind of build up your association. Another thing that Fabrics adds is something called a discovery controller. And this controller doesn't do IO no like normal. It, uh, it gives you a kind of um, name service, sort of. iSCSI has a very similar concept. In fact, there are a lot of things in Enzyme or Fabrics, especially when we get into TCP, that look very close to iSCSI, if you're familiar with it. Um, but this is a way that you can connect to uh, almost like a DNS service, sort of, for NVMe over Fabrics, and find the addresses and kind of connection information for other controllers that actually do I.O. for you to connect to. So <coughs> we talked about commands and completions before for basic NVMe. And in Fabrics, uh, there's a new uh, abstraction called a capsule, which is how you are going to submit commands to get completions back. Um, so we embed a CQE or an SQE into a capsule that we're going to send over the transport, and that's going to represent a command we want to submit um, and a, or a completion we're going to receive. And you can think of the SQ and the CQ as being a FIFO of these capsules rather than just the Q entries themselves. And in particular, the one reason that there's kind of this bigger abstraction than this a Q entry is that you can have data associated with a capsule which represents kind of the data buffer that goes along with it when you're actually sending data to the other side or having data come back. Um, I mentioned before that Fabrics commands do not ever use the PRP style of scatter together lists. They always use this SGL um, scatter, scatter together list approach. Um, among other things, uh, as we'll see in the future, as we get further along, um, there are different types of SGLs it needs to use depending on what transport you're using. Um, you also, uh, in, in, in Fabrics, in some cases, you're able to um, embed data directly in the capsule. So you can have a capsule that logically, as it's sent over the wire, contains both the Q entry as well as the data associated with it. Uh, or you can have an approach where uh, the command, the, the Q entry is sent across, in particular the submission Q entry for the command, and it has a scatter gather list saying that there's some kind of buffer <coughs> on the host side that the transport has a way to manage that you can do read and write from, but it's not included as part of the capsule. There's some other transport defined method for the I.O. <coughs> I need some more water. That was actually a good pausing point. Now I want to kind of drill down a little bit further of the stack and talk about the TCP transport and specifically how Fabrics works over TCP. <coughs> so the TCP transport for Fabrics defines its own little protocol with its own kind of packets um, that it calls um, protocol data units because it's, as I mentioned before, it's a lot like iSCSI. So they're PDUs, which is a similar uh, frame, a word you'll hear in iSCSI, that are used to do the communication both to pass capsules and to manage how data is transferred that goes along with a capsule. <coughs> in the TCP transport, we use a separate TCP connection for every single Q pair. So your admin Q pair is a single TCP connection, and every IO Q pair you do are additional uh, TCP connections. I believe this is different from iSCSI, which kind of uses a single socket for everything. Uh, TCP supports encapsule data, but only for commands, only when you're sending data out, not for data coming back. And it also supports uh, something that it defines as a command buffer, which I'll describe in a bit which is how you can do data without using encapsule data, but a way that you can <coughs> kind of have an associated data buffer that there are other PDUs that do IO to and from that data buffer. So these are some of the PDU types. Actually, these are all the PDU types. 
that we have with TCP. We have two at the beginning, which deal with actually how you establish your connection. You set some parameters that are at the TCP level, such as if you're going to use digests on your PDUs or not. Um, there's two more that are when an error happens that is detected at kind of the TCP protocol level, we have a way of reporting that error back and asking the other side, telling the other side we're going to terminate the, the connection, and these go in both directions. Then we have PDUs to send command capsules, which contain an SQE, and response capsules, which contain a completion. And finally, we have three PDUs that manage how we send data. We have PDUs to allow us to send data from the host to the controller. So you can think of this as something you would use perhaps for a write. Um, from the controller back to the host, which you would use for a read. And then something called ready to transmit, which if you know iSCSI, it's just like the one in iSCSI. Um, and has to do with how the controller can throttle when it's ready for more data to come from the host. And in particular, uh, in NVMe over Fabrics, all the data I.O. when you're not using encapsulated data is initiated by the controller side. The controller decides when it wants to transfer data in a given direction. Yes? When would you use uh, encapsulated data versus use the controller data? Um, it, depends on, it depends on what you're doing. There's, for example, there's a cap on how much encapsulated data you would want to, that you can do in TCP in particular. Also, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, I think admin queue pairs can only do ICD on TCP, if I remember correctly. But in uh, the driver, it's more that currently it's based on what is the size you can do, which is determined by the controller. It tells you kind of what's the maximum cap, uh, capsule size it can handle. So what does a PDU look like uh, in NVMe over TCP? Um, first, they all start with what's called a common header, which is a fixed size structure that includes things like the type of the PDU that is being sent, and that's followed by a PDU-specific header. And this varies in size based on what type of PDU you are and has PDU-specific data. So for example, uh, the error reporting uh, PDUs, in this PDU-specific header, they actually have the header of the other PDU that triggered the problem, as well as information telling you which field in the PDU was incorrect. Then you can have a header digest if you have turned them on. It's a, a negotiated feature between the two sides. Then you have a data region if your PDU contains data, followed finally by a data digest, which is also something that's optional based on if you've negotiated it during connection setup. So let's walk through a few examples of how we are going to send data um, across a connection with NVMe over TCP. And I'll start with the easy one, which is we're going to look at the PDU sent for a command that's sending some data from the host to the controller and we're going to embed the data inside the capsule that we send. So we start off, we've got to build the actual NVMe command we want to do. Um, and I should have mentioned before, uh, these, the commands for the most part um, are defined identically to the way you would define commands for PCI. There are a few subtle differences and there's a new command with a set of subcommands for fabric specific operations. But for things like read and write, aside from the SGL being a different type, they're otherwise identical. So we're going to construct the actual submission queue entry for whatever command we're doing. Um, for any data that we, for the data that we're using, in this case we have data that we're going to send, uh, we're going to use what's called a data block SGL. So the data block is a, a specific type. So when we fill out the SGL, we're going to use the data block type. Um, and for ICD, we're actually going to say that the address or offset is zero, always, and the length of the SGL is how much data is going to be included. We then append that data right behind this is the uh, SQE, and we slap uh, the common header for the PDU in front. Um, the payload-specific header portion uh, for capsules is actually just the queue entry itself. And that right there is our full PDU, and we'll send that across to the controller, and the controller will process it and figure out the result of the operation. It will construct a completion queue entry and stick it in a capsule with a common header and send that across to the host. And that's the whole process of how we get data back and forth. And that one's pretty simple, right? Uh, in TCP, it's just immediately in the stream embedded as part of the message that we send along with our uh, SQE. So now let's get to the more complex cases. <coughs> 
And the first one we'll talk about is we're going to do a request that is going to receive data. So think of this like an IO read request. So we are going to send a request from the host to the controller, and the controller is going to send data back to us. So the first thing we do, from the host, we configure some kind of command buffer. And it, it doesn't matter kind of the backing store for it, but logically, um, the buffer goes from zero to n. And it's, you know, of however many bytes that we're doing. And we can back it however we want an IO back or something. It doesn't matter. But logically, it's just a kind of contiguous buffer. Then we're going to build our command entry um, and, and slap a header on it. So we're going to have, this is our entire command capsule. And at this time, we're going to use an SGL entry. But for TCP, we're going to use what's called a transport type. Um, and there's a set of types and fabrics that are specific to a given transport. Um, and they start a certain number. And for TCP, the first transport type is this command buffer. It's the only one TCP uses. For example, RDMA, for example, has its own transport types. I mean, a transport type means we're going to do data by reading and writing from this command buffer. And then this is our entire PDU, and we're going to send it off to the controller, for example, for our read request. And the controller is going to look at it, and it's going to say, um, oh, no, this is a, yeah, this is a read. It's going to get some data. Maybe it's read it from the drive. It's got a chunk of data that it's going to send to us. Um, and it's going to stuff that into a controller to host PDU um, and slap the little common header. And this tells us uh, where in the region of the command buffer this data goes, how long it is, and what the starting offset. And also, one of the requirements in Fabrics is that the buffer needs to be read, and read or written sequentially. And it's a protocol error if you get those out of order in case you've dropped one or something like that. So it's going to build this as a PDU and send it across to the host. And the host is going to copy this data into the command buffer. In this case, we didn't get all of it yet. So the controller is going to construct another one where the rest of the data, the host will receive it. Now the command buffer is full. And finally, at this point, the controller uh, is going to send the completion in across in a response capsule PDU. So now let's look at the last case which is the most complicated case, which in this case, we as the host want to send data to the controller, so a write. But I mentioned before that all the I.O. is kind of initiated by the controller. So we're going to start off again. We have a command buffer, but this time our command buffer has data from the start because we're sending data over, not getting data back. And we're going to build a command capsule like before, also a transport block. And in fact, this looks identical to the last uh, read request. The, the direction of the data moving is implied by what command you're doing. It's nothing specific that's kind of command agnostic in the, the SQE. It's instead, it has to be inferred by what command you're doing. And we'll send that across, and the controller decides, OK, I'm ready to read some portion of the data. And when it's ready to do that, it constructs a ready to transmit, which tells you which tells the host which part of the buffer it wants to read. In particular, it gives you an offset and a length of how much data the controller wants back from the host at this point. So we send that across. Um, and so in this case, this R2T is saying, I want this particular chunk of the data. Again, it has to start at the beginning and stay sequential. Um, the host responds by building a host to controller data PDU. Um, and this includes the offset and length, so you can confirm that you got what you asked for. It has a little common header, and then the data is in the data kind of portion of the PDU. And in, in this case, you notice I only got part of the data. So you can do multiple cycles of this. Um, and you could have multiple um, hosted controllers until you actually fulfill an R2T request. But I didn't want to put like 20 lines in the slide because it wouldn't be readable. Yes? Well, the indexes are, the controller, when it's ready to get some data, it has to ask from the beginning and go sequentially to follow the protocol. And it's responsible however it wants to handle the data when it arrives, it can do. But that's kind of, it's implementation defined. I mean, the, the way this command buffer is also implementation defined, it's just a way to think about the offsets and links that are passed in these PDUs. The offsets and links, though, are only in terms of this buffer on the host side, not the controller side. And then finally, when we finish transferring the whole thing, then the controller sends back a response with a completion saying, hey, we're done. 
Okay, so that is my little introduction to fabrics and fabrics over TCP. And let me see how I am on time, because now I don't know when I'm supposed to end. Uh, 11.45 plus 20 minutes, right? Is it 12.05? Well, I'm not completely behind the schedule. All right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about, uh, well, I want to shift gears now and talk about kind of what I've done so far to implement this in FreeBSD and kind of the design that it uses. So the first kind of abstract choice I made was to use a three-layer design for how I was going to structure how all this kind of works. So in the middle, I have some notion of a transport abstraction. Uh, and, and it's somewhat aligned with how the fabric spec itself is defined. So the transport uh, on the top end, it kind of allows you to send and receive capsules. And you can attach data to a capsule in some way, in particular to a command capsule, or a data buffer, rather. And then at the bottom end, you kind of have multiple backends for different transports. And in theory, um, when you're first creating an association, you kind of have to know the type of transport you're creating to kind of get it started. But once you've created a queue pair and kind of allocated it from the yellow region, uh, then you don't have to worry about any more transport specifics. It's kind of like, uh, I mean, it's kind of like a dev switch or an ifnet or something in the kernel where we have kind of an abstract layer between consumers of the interface uh, and the back end, protocol backends. So the protocol backends uh, kind of sit below this, and you can have them for TCP or RDMA or any other fabric you wish to do. And at the top, the kind of clients of this abstraction um, are either a host or a controller. So I started in user space. And so let's walk through the bits I've done in user space so far. Um, I have a library called libNVMF, and it defines kind of that yellow layer, defines a transport interface, um, which includes both uh, the API that kind of faces upward, that allows you to send and receive capsules, but also internally, it defines a class, and it's in C, so it's a struct of function pointers, of an interface that transports are required to implement to actually be a transport. And there's a little bit of glue kind of in the yellow to handle some things so that we don't have to duplicate as many things down the transport specific bits. Um, currently, it provides an implementation of the TCP transport. And uh, this library is designed for simplicity, and as I say later, debugability. It is not designed to be high performance. It was something so that I could um, debug it easily and make sure it was correct <laughs> and functional. So uh, it is not thread safe. It's, it, you know, if you really want to do thread safe, you're going to have to do that yourself. Uh, and it uses blocking I.O. and sockets, and not asynchronous, not non-blocking I.O. with a, a more asynchronous stuff, just to make life simpler. It does contain several helper routines that sit on top of the kind of bare transport layer to allow you to do things. Uh, one example of this is it provides a helper routine for a host that allows you to send a command and wait for the response to come back, um, which I use a lot in the user land bits. I've then written um, both a user space host and controller. So the host um, is a little program called nvmfdd in my branch. Um, you can think of it kind of like dd. Uh, it connects to remote controller. Uh, you've, you give parameters to tell you like the address of the I.O. controller you're connecting to, which namespace you want to access. Uh, you can, I believe you can get an offset, like a starting LBA, and how many bytes, and then a read or write command. And then it reads either from standard in to construct a write command that it sends across, or if you're doing a read, it sends a read command across and dumps that to standard out. But you can do simple I.O., then this is enough to kind of test um, the protocol is sufficient to test all those cases I described before for how we send and receive data. And doing this in use line was handy because it was a lot easier to find, to find and fix the bugs that way. Um, and then more recently, I've written a simple user space controller uh, I call NVMFD. Um, and it does support multiple namespaces, and you can have a namespace that's backed by a file or a character device that looks like a disk, uh, for example, a Zvol if you wanted to. Um, as well as you can kind of create a temporary RAM disk whose contents start off with zero and get thrown away when you're done. Um, and it also provides a discovery controller as well as an I.O. controller. Um, these things are not designed for performance. 
And for the most part, they're not designed to be used outside of development. Um, they're really designed to help me flesh out bugs in my implementation and my assumptions, in particular as I was testing against Linux, to make sure that my notion of things matched up with theirs. Um, sometimes their notions are uh, odd. They don't believe that errors exist. For example, I remember early on, I, had a, I didn't like a field of one of their PDUs because of a bug I had, and I sent back a, the, one of the little PDUs that said, I want to terminate the connection because of an error. And the kernel, the Linux kernel printed out unknown PDU type, which completely doesn't understand that errors exist. Still close the connection because of an unknown PDU type, but uh, doesn't seem to be as graceful. So in my user space implementation, these are the kind of three layers I, I ended up with. I have libnvmf, and it kind of handles this yellow layer, um, and it's hard to see on this thing. So the RDMA and fiber channel are hashed out because they're not done but they could be done in the future. Um, but it does provide TCP. And then I've implemented a host, which is this NVMFDD, and a controller. And so I kind of have that bit done in user space. So the next step I worked on, um, or I've, I've kind of bounced back and forth between some of these, uh, is a kernel data path, where the goal is to handle, um, for actual performance, you want to handle the bulk I.O. in the kernel itself. You don't want to do that in user space. So I took the same kind of transport abstraction that I had written in libnvmf and mostly mirrored it into the kernel. Um, there is some regrettable code duplication. In particular, there's some bits of the TCP uh, thing that I currently have duplicated, like how do you validate a PDU and decide which fields are invalid and all the error checking for that. But unlike the user space case, the kernel data path, because it's written for a kernel, it's written for our kernel and for performance, um, does not use blocking. Instead, it is much more asynchronous and uses callbacks for different things. So for example, if you are a host and you submit a capsule to be sent with a command, along with that, you would, well, let me describe the right one. I'm skipping ahead. When you create a queue, you, uh, pass along a callback that you want to be invoked any time any type of capsule is received. So if you're a host, this callback is going to be called when you get a completion back. If you're a controller, this callback is called when you get a command that you need to handle and respond to. Um, there's also a callback for I.O. operations. So when you uh, are going to do I.O. along with a command in some way, either reading or writing, uh, as part of the kind of describing the buffer that holds either where I want the data to go or where it's coming from, you have to register a callback that gets called when it's done. And in particular, when it's done is kind of non-obvious. Uh, one of the things that iSCSI more recently kind of have shoved into it as a, a, like a bit on the side was a notion of zero copy for buffers so that it would use unmapped inbuffs and avoid copying the data kind of inside the iSCSI layer before sending it down to the NIC. Uh, and then for fabrics, I did that by design from the front. So for example, when you send data uh, out of connection over TCP in the kernel, we're going to create um, external inbuffs that directly reference the data buffer you're using to send the data out, like when you're doing uh, a write, for example. I um, mean, you have a struct bio in your host side, and you're going to send the pages from the bio out. Um, then we use an external inbuff that has a reference count back to this, this kind of I.O. buffer. And only when all those inbuffs have been sent and your NIC has gotten the TX completion interrupt back to free the inbus, does the reference count drop all the way to zero, and then your IO callback gets complete. So depending on the way your NIC is working and how kind of the flow of interrupts, you may actually get a, your callback for your completion coming back and being received by the NIC in a different, you know, on a different inbuff, you may get the completion callback for your completion before you find out that your IO is fully kind of done and freed and in particular that it's free to report the I.O. is done and that it's safe to now, like not depend, it's safe to reuse whatever the backing store is for the bio or the CCP or something like that. So there's not a, in particular this I.O. callback can happen after you've gotten your completion, which is non-obvious at first glance. And then finally, uh, when you create a queue, you also give a second callback, which says if an error occurs, call me to let me know. And this is usually so that you can decide, I want to kill the connection and kind of deal with that. Um, in the kernel, what I've chosen to do is for all the IO buffers that are attached to a capsule, 
Uh, I use this abstraction called a memdesk. We've kind of had in the kernel for a while. So if you've seen commits from me to kind of clean up memdesks recently, um, and actually now we even use them in the base engine me driver to simplify some things. Um, and I've added a whole set of routines to copy data in and out of a buffer described by memdesk. That's all motivated and, and part of this work. But in particular, this means that inside the transport layer and the transports themselves, they don't know anything about mbuffs or bios or CCBs or if it's a kernel buffer or anything. They just get this opaque handle to a memory descriptor, a memdesk, and they know the offset into it and the length of how much data out of that memdesk they're supposed to um, send out or where they get data in, where they're supposed to put it. And so nothing, uh, the, up in the host or the controller, you might know what kind of buffer you want to deal with, but nothing below that anywhere in the stack has to know what kind of data buffer you're working with. Hmm, that's mostly true. Uh, in TCP, in order to construct those external mbuffs, I have to know what kind of data buffer you're working with, but only there. Um, and then the design here is that user space should still handle the initial setup. In particular, one of the things that NVMe and the spec mandate that, for example, Linux doesn't implement and I don't implement yet, um, is it says that all remote controllers should implement TLS, meaning that you can have your connection go over TLS and not just in the, in the clear. Uh, and I don't think it makes any sense at all to try to do a TLS negotiation in the kernel. That seems rather nutty to me. Oh, five minutes? Yeah, thank you. I'm actually not too bad on time. So the design is do the fast bits in the kernel. So the part I have done so far is I have a host, NVMF. Um, it gives you an in kernel fabrics host. It does not try to share code with NVMe. If you look hard enough, uh, out on the interwebs, there is a GitHub repository that actually has an NVMe client for FreeBSD over RDMA. Uh, and that particular code um, does things to the existing NVMe driver that are kind of gross. And in particular, when I had a design that had those I.O. callbacks and the complexity, the fact that when you're doing I.O. you have two callbacks to deal with, it was just a lot simpler to kind of write my cam sim from scratch rather than trying to shove that into the NVMe driver. Um, but it does create devices that look like NVMe X. They're a, they're hung off of Nexus instead of off of a PCI bus, but they show up the same in D message. It creates similar devices in the slash dev, so you can use NVMe control with them directly for things like identify. Um, we only support disk access via CAM, so NDAX devices, not NVD. And then one other thing it has uh, is if some kind of connection error occurs, we'll tear down the connections, but the new best device stays around, and all the IO requests that were open stay paused. And then you have the ability to reconnect with a new set of connections, at which point all the I.O. resumes. Um, so one other part of this is I mentioned some parts in user space. So there's some extensions to NVMe control. Um, you can find out fabrics, things, and identify. A uh, few new commands, and this will probably be where I have to stop. Uh, you have a discover command to query a discovery controller and dump its log of what things it knows about. There's a connect command which is how you actually connect to remote side and establish a new host. A disconnect command, when you want it to go away. And then there's a reconnect, which is what you use that if an error occurs, my TCP connections go away, and, but I want to reestablish and keep going and not lose IO, you can use reconnect to do that. All right, so the things that are currently in the kernel today, I have an NVMF transport.ko, that's kind of the yellow layer. Uh, NVMF TCP, and then NVMF.ko. And in particular, um, these blue boxes depend on the yellow, as well as the green, but you don't have to load all the transports. So you have to explicitly load what transport I want, as well as which kind of client I want. All right. What am I left at, Peter? About two? All right, I can maybe do this last slide real quick. Yep. Well, two slides. Um, the things I still need to work on are an in-kernel controller, which is a big ball of work that I won't go into here, but my slides will be available if you want to read them later. Um, it might be nice to do other transports. I have some interest perhaps in RDMA. I actually have someone who emailed me two weeks ago whose company wants fiber channel. So I'll let them have that fun. Um, 
TLS should be doable, and it should be doable just fine in FreeBSD using kernel TLS offload. This should be pretty transparent, actually. And I'm going to skip past this part, which you can see later. So I need to do this slide. Um, the code is available in a branch uh, off my GitHub repository. It's called NVMF2. Don't ask about the first one. Um, <laughs> There is a caveat, which is this is my development work branch, and I rebase for my workflow. So if you're going to try to follow it for some reason before it lands in main, um, you'll have to suffer, and just know that's part of how I roll as I rebase. Um, I do need to give a big thanks to Chelsea, who has paid for all of this. So this has been something that uh, they funded me to do. And then lastly, what little time remaining, I will wait for questions. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, plug this into Beehive. Um, it's not really relevant to Beehive because the transports are all something that happened over top of an existing PV device. It doesn't really make sense because the NVMe emulation in Beehive is basically a PCI device. Uh, oh, oh, and your question was about uh, doing this in Beehive. Warner. Um, uh, they are loaded using resources. So for the NVMe NS devices, I actually keep the BIOS queued, um, but no one should do I/O via those anyway, even in the PCI driver. So I basically keep the BIO queued, uh, and then when we re if you detach the device, I'll abort them all, or if you reconnect, then they'll get resumed and done. With CAM, I think actually life is less terrible. I think with CAM, I'm actually able to freeze the queue and send them back with a CAM aborted status. Uh, and then later, uh, when I get reconnected, I unfreeze the queue and CAM resubmits them. So I think for CAM, the CCBs actually get put in back up. So Warner was asking about a uh, pause IO. Is that, am I done, Peter? OK. Yeah, yeah, you can find me afterwards if you have more questions, especially we're going to be at lunch, I believe, next. No? Oh. Yeah, I'm used to lunch at noon. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Uh, this is a, a, small, a small token of appreciation.